Hi folks, welcome back to the Tabletop's Edge and part two of our naval combat tutorial for World in Flames Collector's Edition. Now last time out, I gave you a brief overview of the naval combat procedure and then we started to take a look at each of the steps in a little more detail. We saw how to initiate combat and we looked at how search rolls work as well as how to calculate your surprise points. And we left off at the point where you determine the combat type. And before picking up at that point, I'd like to take a minute or two here and just talk about naval interception. Interception occurs during the naval movement step when an active side's moving task force first enters a sea zone that contains face-up units, either naval or air units, of the inactive side. As an example, we're going to look again at the Commonwealth, which has four units, two in the four box, two in the three box, three of which are face up, and the Germans have a stack of naval units based here in Brest, France. During the Germans' naval movement step, he decides to sail this task force out into the Bay of Biscay. The Commonwealth player would have an attempt, would have an opportunity to attempt to intercept that moving stack. To do so, they would need to turn down, face down, one of their face up units. In this case, we just turn HMS Malaya face down and we would be able to proceed. Now, you can use an aircraft unit unless the weather is storm or blizzard. You could also use any submarines. And before you make your interception attempt, you would have to announce whether or not you're going to include your subs uh, in the upcoming potential interception combat. Now, even if you decide not to commit your subs, you can still use a sub uh, and turn it face down in order to make the interception attempt. Also, with this unit face down, if there's going to be, if you wish to initiate combat in the upcoming uh, naval combat phase or opponent's naval combat phase, turning that unit face down in the interception attempt, as long as it is still in one of the sections of the sea box, so in other words, it did not get aborted or sunk during any interception combats, that will suffice or fill the requirement for you to turn a face up unit face down. So you can kind of think of it as, I only need to turn one unit face down and that's going to uh, cover this sea zone for the entire impulse for any naval combat, so long as the unit is able to stay at sea. Now, having turned a unit face down and declared whether or not you're committing your submarines, you then make a search roll, just like uh, you would in a normal naval combat. If the search roll is successful, which means you've rolled equal to or less than the modified search number of a uh, section that has your units involved in the interception, you have successfully intercepted the moving stack. Now, the moving stack has two options at this point. The first option is they can simply end their movement in this current sea zone and go into any section of the sea box that they could normally do. There would be no interception combat, however. You would have to um, initiate combat in the following naval combat uh, steps to include rolling new search rolls. So if that were the case, it would look something like this. The Germans, the slowest ship the Germans have in this task force is Bismarck with a speed of five. So they've spent one speed and one range to enter Bay of Biscay. If they decided not to try to uh, continue and just end their movement here, you would be able to place the task force in the four box or any of the boxes you would desire. That would end that naval interception attempt. Now, if they sail and the Commonwealth is able to roll a four or less, and they decide they do not want to remain in the Bay of Biscay, they can attempt to fight their way through. When this happens, the moving stack will go into any section of the sea box, just as if they were ending their movement there, and then you would fight what essentially amounts to a normal naval combat. You would, uh, then the Germans would need to roll the, uh, uh, a search roll to determine the surprise points that either side will have. You resolve the naval combat 
the first round of an interception combat, the moving stack will always be included, whether or not there are other units that may or may not be included in its actual um, section of the C-Box. The interception combat ends when there are no units remaining from either side in the C-Zone, or both sides have failed to find one another with their search rolls. At that point, if there are any units still left in the moving stack, the moving stack can continue its movement as if there were no combat. However, they do have to subtract from their movement allowance, not their, not their range, just the movement allowance, the unmodified search number of the box they went into. So this would be a reason why if the Germans were attempting to fight their way through, they would not want to put themselves in the four box for the interception combat because that would then consume all of Bismarck's speed, meaning she would not be able to continue uh, onto a different C zone. However, you can split the moving task force after an interception combat, although be aware this would count as a separate naval move because your ships, even though they started in the same location, are not going to end up in the same location. And the light cruisers would be able to continue to move. They would have one more speed left since their speed is a six, allowing them to get to an adjacent C zone. That's why you may see sometimes the moving stack will opt to go into the one or even the zero box and attempt to fight their way through from there. However, the danger of going into a low C box is that you will be giving your opponents more surprise points, which will allow them to inflict that much more damage on you or lessen the amount of damage you can inflict on them. So naval interception, as you enter the C zone, turn a unit face down, make a search roll. If you succeed, the moving stack can either end its move in the C zone and there's no combat until the naval combat step, or they can try to fight their way through by entering one of the C boxes fighting what is essentially at that point a regular naval combat, at the conclusion of which any surviving uh, moving task force ships can continue their move by uh, subtracting the C box, uh, the search number of the uh, section of the C box they were in from their movement. Now, let's go ahead and resume our look at the naval combat process. Now, when it comes to determining the type of combat the naval combat will be, you have three choices to choose from. It could be a naval air combat, a surface combat, or a submarine combat. Now, the side that has surprise points to spend, if they have at least four surprise points, they can simply spend those four surprise points and make the choice of what type of combat it will be. And remember, again, they can choose a type of combat that will result in no actual fighting, in which case you would just go right back to step two of the process where sides decide whether or not to, to include their or commit their subs, and then you would make search rolls again. Now, if neither side has four surprise points to spend or they decide they do not want to spend the surprise points to choose the combat type, there's a priority list that you go down to determine what it will be. Now, both sides are going to fight the same type of combat, so you won't have one side fighting a surface and another, fight, another side fighting uh, naval air combat. It's, it's naval air all the way or surface or submarine. The first priority is if either side has any air units that are involved in the combat, they can choose to make it a naval air uh, type of combat. In the example here, where the Commonwealth has rolled a five, the Germans have rolled a four, because this naval air adds plus one to the search number here, the Germans would be able to include there are three surface units in the four box, as well as this naval air unit and this submarine, if they had chosen to include both of their submarines. Since, he's in, since this unit is involved in the combat, the Germans could choose to select a naval air combat. If both sides have air units, and when I say air, air units, it's aircraft units or an undamaged carrier. And if you're using the carrier planes option, those carriers would obviously need to have a, a carrier plane unit on them. Both sides have, if they both have air units present, for instance, if HMS Indomitable were in the uh, four box here, 
and involved in the combat, the active side makes the choice first whether to make it a naval air combat or not. Now, if you choose not to make it a naval air combat or if there are no air units involved in the combat, you can choose to make it a submarine combat if you have submarines and your opponent has convoy points. You can see here in this example, if the Germans had committed both of their subs before the search rolls, they still could not choose to make this a submarine combat because the Commonwealth has no convoy points present. If, however, there were convoy points in the zero box here and the Germans decided to include the zero box in the uh, naval combat, then the Germans would be able to make it a submarine combat by virtue of the fact that they have subs and their opponent has some convoy points. Now, if it is neither a naval air combat nor a submarine combat, it will be a surface combat. Once you've determined the type of combat, now it's time to resolve the combat, and that's going to require a look at the naval combat chart. We're going to start off, we'll look at each of the three different types of naval combat and how they differ a little bit. Procedurally, they're very similar, but there are a couple of important differences, and you'll find most of those on the naval combat chart itself. So we're going to start off and we'll look at the surface combat first, since that's kind of the standard or default type of naval combat, by taking a look at the naval combat chart. The naval combat chart is one of the bigger charts in the game, and it's found on the inside of the player aid, and it really it stretches all the way across the top on both sides of the fold. There's a white box here on the far right, which contains some very useful information on uh, combat choice, how you calculate surprise points, as well as how you can spend surprise points, and some sections down here on any aircraft fire, which we'll get to when we take a look at the naval air combat. Now the chart, as large as it is, can be a little intimidating to uh, try to figure out. So we're gonna take a little bit closer look at it to have it make some sense to you. Now to use this chart, you simply are going to cross index the number of factors that you're shooting at the type of target here. So you'll find a column, you'll come down to a row with the number of targets you're shooting at, and you're going to find these three, or this green column and a gold column here. Now, the tricky part is figuring out which row up top you're using and which column, as well as what all these various numbers mean. So you can see the three red rows at the top of the chart are labeled air to sea, sub and ASW, anti-air and surface. These refer to the type of factor that you are firing at your opponent. So in a surface combat, you are going to need to total up the surface attack factors of all of your units that are involved in the combat. And then you will consult this bottom red row here, the anti-air and surface factor row and find the appropriate column that matches the total factors that you have shooting at the enemy. If instead you're doing a naval air combat, you're going to total up the number of air to sea factors in all of your aircraft that are attacking the enemy and you'll find the column here. Now you'll notice right off the bat that six to nine surface factors gets you on this third column in, whereas it only takes three air to sea factors to reach that same column. You will find that air to sea factors are much more uh, effective, I guess we'll say, than your surface factors. If you are doing a submarine combat, you'll be looking at your sub factors here and the ASW factors in return. Now it's important to remember that if you are fighting a surface combat and you have submarines included, those submarines are going to be treated exactly like any other normal surface ship. So you will use their surface attack factors on this bottom row, not the middle row, and you'll just add them in with all of your other surface ships. You're only going to use this sub and ASW row if you're fighting a submarine combat, and we'll look at that in just a few minutes. Now, 
the blue columns on the left-hand side here are split into two. You have one for enemy bombers and one for enemy ships. Most of the time, you're going to be looking at this enemy ships column. The enemy bombers is only used for anti-aircraft fire against enemy bombers that are attacking your ships in a naval air combat. You simply total up the number of ships that your opponent has in the task forces that are involved in this particular round of combat, and then you will cross-reference that with the column that you calculated from your attacking factors to give you the results of the combat. Now, one thing to keep in mind, normally each individual naval unit counts as one enemy ship. The exception to that are convoy points. If there are convoy points in the sea zone that are included in this round of the naval combat, for every five convoy points that are present, or portion thereof, that will count as one ship. Now, if you're using the ships in flames uh, optional rule, it's actually every three convoy points. But for the uh, classic version, every five convoy points or portion thereof will add one ship to the enemy uh, target size. Once you've determined the number of targets and the factors that you are shooting at, you then have the opportunity to spend some surprise points. You can spend two surprise points to either increase your own column, one column, or to decrease your opponent's column, one column. Because what's going to happen in each round of naval combat, much like air-to-air -air combat, both sides will shoot at one another and the effects of the combat will be implemented simultaneously. So even if you score enough results to completely destroy your opponent's um, units that are involved in the combat, they're still gonna get that shot off at you before they are removed. Now, you can spend as many multiples of two surprise points as you like to shift up. So if you have six surprise points to spend and you really want to hurt the enemy, you can spend all six surprise points to shift your attacking column three columns to the right. Likewise, you can shift your opponents down and off of the uh, chart entirely where they won't be able to get a shot at you. Once you've determined your final column with all of the surprise points being spent uh, that you desire, you will come down, you cross-reference. If we have, say, uh, six to nine surface factors shooting at four enemy ships, you're going to see here a green sort of three columns here and a gold column. If it's a surface combat, the gold column is ignored. That is the anti-aircraft fire results. So we're looking here at an X, a D, and an A. Those are the three types of possible results in a naval combat. The X is destroyed or sunk, D is damaged, and A is aborted. The number in the box will tell you how many of those results you have inflicted on the enemy units. So on the example here, shooting at four ships with six to nine factors, you will get a dash for destroyed results, which means zero, one damage result, and two abort results. You will then implement those results on the ships, and I'll show you how we do that shortly. Now, here's an example where the Commonwealth has initiated combat in the sea zone. The weather is fine. The Germans have three ships in the four section. They rolled a four for their search roll, allowing them to participate. The Commonwealth failed their search roll with a five, which means the Germans can have a choice to include both sections or one or the other. In this case, we're going to assume the Germans have chosen only to engage the Commonwealth ships in the three section. Calculating the surprise points, the Germans get five for the Commonwealth search roll plus the modified search number of four for a total of nine surprise points. The Commonwealth get three for their modified search roll uh, or search number of three plus four that the Germans rolled for a total of seven. Subtracting seven from nine gives the Germans two surprise points that they can spend in the upcoming round of naval combat. Since there are no aircraft, submarines, or convoy points involved, it will automatically be a surface combat because the Germans do not have four points to spend to choose something else. Now, with 
all of that calculated, we would look at the naval combat table after totaling up our surface attack factors as well as the number of enemy ships involved. The Germans have seven, three, and one for a total of 11, shooting at just two enemy units, while the Commonwealth will have six plus three is a nine total surface factors, shooting at three targets. What that looks like on the naval combat chart is this. The Germans, with their 11 combat factors, are going to be on the 10 to 14 column here, on the surface row. They are shooting at two enemy ships. Coming across there, cross-referencing cross that, you see there are no destroyed results, one damage result, and three abort results. The Commonwealth has nine factors, so they're shooting on the six to nine column here, and they're shooting at three targets. So on the three to four row, they get no destroyed, one damaged, and two abort results. Now, the Germans have two surprise points that they can spend. If they wanted to spend those to increase their column, they could move one column to the right, to the 15 to 20 column, Shooting at two ships would give them no destroyed, two damage results, and three abort results. Or they could choose to uh, shift the Commonwealth one column to the left. Shooting at the three uh, German targets would give them no destroyed, no damage, and two abort. Now the Germans are interested in avoiding damage to their uh, surface ships since they have far fewer of them than the Commonwealth do, and achieving just one additional uh, damage result isn't going to make a big dent in the Royal Navy. So they will spend their two surprise points to shift the Commonwealth one left to the three to five. So we now have the Germans result with one damage, three abort. The Commonwealth is going to inflict two abort results. Now, how do we resolve those aborts? Let's go back and take a look at the units themselves. Each of the results obtained from the naval combat table now need to be applied to a specific naval unit. And you will apply them in a surface naval combat. The owner will choose which unit suffers all of the results. You apply the results one at a time and you begin with all of the destroyed results then you implement all of the damage results, and then finally you implement all of the abort results. When you apply a result to a naval unit, you will need to look at its defense value, which is the value in the upper right corner here. You will roll one die. If you roll equal to or less than the defense value of the naval unit, the naval unit will suffer that result. If, however, you roll higher than the defense value, the result is downgraded one level. So in other words, on an X result or a destroyed result, if that were applied to Bismarck and the German player rolled a three or higher, it would be downgraded from an X result to a D result and the Bismarck would be damaged. Damage results get downgraded to aborts and abort results get downgraded to a one half abort. And you'll see what we do with the one half aborts at the end of this example. Now, you can continue to apply results. You apply them one at a time. So if, for instance, you were to have three X results or three destroyed results from the combat table, you don't have to assign all three destroyed results before rolling. You can assign your first destroyed result, roll the die, see if it's uh, in fact, remains a destroyed result or if it's downgraded to a damage result and then implement the next one and so on. Now you can no longer select a naval unit to receive a result once it has been sunk or once it has been aborted. And in the case of an X result that gets converted to a damage result, for instance, the X result applied to the Bismarck and the Germans were to roll a four, higher than the defense value of two, it would become damaged. That does not count as having received um, a destroyed or an X result. It's until the ship is actually uh, sunk. 
Same thing with the abort result. So following the example we were looking at right here, where we have these three German ships fighting these two Commonwealth ships in this round, the Germans with their 11 surface factors at those two ships achieved one damage and three abort results. So it would be up to the Commonwealth player to select one of their two ships to receive the damage result. If they place that on the Malaya with a lower defense value, they have a better chance of avoiding the damage result and having it instead be downgraded to an abort result. They would roll the die and they roll a two, which means that the damage result does in fact remain a damage result. Malaya would be considered damaged. Now we have three abort results to implement. Since the Malaya is already damaged and is going to abort at the end of the naval combat anyway, the Commonwealth figures why not apply an abort result to it as well. They would roll again and they roll another two, which results in Malaya being aborted. It's going to be turned face down. It's also going to be marked with a damage marker that comes in the game. And it is now no longer eligible to receive any more results in this round of the naval combat, which means we have two abort results remaining, the first of which is going to be applied to Mauritius, which rolls a one. That's less than their defense value, which means Mauritius is also aborted. Now, all of the enemy naval units are either sunk or aborted at this point, and we still have one more abort to apply. In this case, the result is ignored. Now, that's not it for the entire round of naval combat. Even though both Commonwealth ships are aborted, one of which is damaged, they still inflicted two abort results that the Germans are going to have to resolve on their side. And so, as the first abort result, they're going to choose Blucher here. Blucher rolls a six, which is equal to, or less than, its defense value, which means it is in fact aborted. It would be turned down and it will abort at the end of this round of naval combat. The second abort, they decide to place on the light cruiser Leipzig. They roll an eight, which again is equal to or less than its defense value, which means it also is aborted. At the end of the first round of naval combat, you will see that the Germans have had two ships aborted the Commonwealth has had two ships aborted, one of which is damaged and would be marked so. At this point, both sides now have an opportunity to either remain in the sea zone or to abort. And if they abort, they're going to have to abort all of their units from the sea zone, including those that were not involved in this naval combat. At this point, it's the Bismarck versus the two remaining Commonwealth ships. Since the Commonwealth is the active player, the Commonwealth would have to declare first whether they are remaining in the sea zone or whether they are aborting. The Commonwealth, not wanting to miss a chance to sink the Bismarck, opts to remain. The Bismarck now, the German player, has to decide whether to stay or have Bismarck accompany the other ships in their return to base. If Bismarck decides to abort, that will end the naval combat and the two Commonwealth ships will be the only ones remaining in the sea zone. If, however, the German likes their chances because the odds are more even now and chooses to remain, you will now go back to step two where both sides have an opportunity to fly in any air units into the sea zone. They would announce whether they are committing any submarines that are in the sea zone. And then you would make your search rolls, calculate your surprise points and go through the combat resolution uh, procedure yet again until Either one side no longer has any units in the sea area or both sides search rolls fail. That's essentially how surface combat and by extension all naval combat works. What we're going to do now is take a look at the differences between a naval air combat and submarine combat to your surface combat.